You and I with Rashmi Shetty is a simple attempt of bringing in stories of people you and I can draw inspiration from. Ordinary folks, extraordinary lives, their uniqueness and individuality that make them interesting to talk to and to listen to. A reaffirmation of the fact, open your eyes wider, the world is far more beautiful when we acknowledge the presence of both you and I. Our guest today is Dr. Colleen Lightbody, also called the Brain Guru, with clients in the Asia Pacific region, the US, Europe, as well as throughout Africa. Her expertise lies in neurosciences, mindfulness, brain based learning, personal and professional coaching, and emotional intelligence. Colleen has a PhD in mindfulness and leadership. From climbing Kilimanjaro and Everest Base Camp to achieving provincial colors in both cycling and triathlon, competing and completing multiple Ironman challenges and cycling challenges, Colleen walks the path of personal mastery. Listen in as she shares with us her inspirational personal victory over grief and trauma, her journey why self-compassion is the need of the hour and why it's okay not being okay. Sad is not bad, she says. Loved it when she spoke on self-worth. Hi, Colleen. Such a pleasure meeting you now, talking to you after listening to your story on the webinars. I, I was part of two of the magnificent webinars that you had your stories on and became a die-hard fan. <laughs> and I needed your story uh, to go out there because I feel people like you are inspirational in times like these, especially, where people give up way faster. So if you can take us through who little Colleen was, to the Dr. Colleen that we see today, and how has your journey been? And what has kept you always striving to be the best side of you is what I'm curious about, Colleen. Thank you, Rashni, and it's a great privilege to um, be connected with you today. And I think you've said something quite important there, which is about the particular times that we're going through at the moment. And I think um, you, you mentioned about people giving up easily and I think um, I think tenacity and resilience and resourcefulness and keeping going is really important um, and particularly in these times so maybe we'll align my, my story a little bit to those kind of themes um, so I mean I've, I've got this picture that that I actually found the other day which I absolutely love is me on a little well actually a huge big red tricycle I was very tiny um, and I remember that tricycle very much, but I, and I do remember that child very much, you know, being quite awkward and ungainly and always getting into trouble and been making mistakes and kind of that child is still around today. I, I'm still a little awkward and, and ungainly and always making mistakes and I kind of often say the wrong thing at the wrong time. Um, but now I've got a very beautiful, sleek uh, pink mountain bike, which is um, a uh, red mountain bike and pink road bike, which is very different to the red tricycle. So um, there has been a change, but I guess we are who we are and we carry that person within us all along. So kind of from, you know, just kind of bumbled through school. I was never very good at school and never very, um, I, was, I, I enjoyed sports. I wasn't the best at it, but I was pretty good at it. Um, I enjoyed getting into trouble in the classrooms, playing pranks and that kind of thing, but wasn't very academic at all um, and never kind of fitted in with the in crowd. And But I kind of liked school. In fact, I actually liked it so much that I, I begged my parents to go to boarding school and actually went to boarding school for the last few, few years of, of schooling. Um, went off to university, failed it, failed it again got into trouble, started drinking and smoking and doing all kinds of irresponsible things, which I was having a lot of fun doing. 
um, but I had two incidents in my life that kind of kind of shifted my world um, around that. Well, actually, that time was one incident, which was where um, my brother went missing in the Okavango swamps, which was a very, very traumatic time. So um, it was when I was at the end of school and we got the news that my brother had gone <clears throat> missing in the Okavango swamps, which is in Botswana. He'd been on safari with my father and he was actually missing for five days in really um, tough territory, um, a place teeming with wildlife. There was a, um, a drought on at the time. So, you know, you think of the Okavango swamps as being like swampy and, and, and sort of moisture, but there was actually a drought on, so there was very little water. And it was an unbelievably traumatic time for me and my family, uh, obviously my parents particularly, my dad being there, helping the rangers search for him, you know, confronting elephants and them having the Botswana paramilitary fly, flying grids over to try and search for my brother, my mother and myself sitting at home waiting for news. My mother never gave up. She always knew that he would be okay. Most of us thought he wouldn't be okay. And cut a long story short, eventually he was found. And I think something shifted a little for me at that stage because I'd always been irresponsible um, fun-loving, giddy, younger sister, and my brother had always been incredibly responsible together and contained. And in that moment, kind of the world shifted a little bit where I, it was kind of showing me that I couldn't be quite as irresponsible as I was, and that we were vulnerable, you know, and this strong brother that I admired so much was vulnerable as well. Um, and anyway, many months later after this incident, my brother went on to develop uh, bipolar affective disorder, which in those days, you know, we didn't talk about, you didn't go see therapists, you, you know, these things were kept very hush hush, we got no family therapy ever whatsoever, and it was very, very traumatic, um, this sensible, together, wonderful, wonderful young man, um, who was very smart as well, by the way, that I really admired, he kind of was, was navigating normal life. I went off to university and spent time with him at university and was navigating um, the extreme highs of mania and the extreme lows of depression. Um, and this was a little strange because I was the one who was irresponsible. I was the one who was giddy and kind of out of sorts. And there was this sensible together brother of mine experiencing these emotional kind of this emotional roller coaster. And I think that was very much part of my growing up, but I did it, 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 was a, it was a process. I dropped out of university a couple of times. I was wrestling with myself. Um, I kind of got married. And, 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 and one or two years into my marriage, I was very young. I was in my early 20s. Um, my brother went missing again. Um, he'd Actually, my, to go back a bit, is that um, about six years previously, my brother and I, or five years previously, my brother and I had actually started the bipolar support group. And from that moment on, my brother had not been ill again. He'd been completely stable um, on his medication. And people in the support group just admired him and adored him because he was an example of what, you know, you could be, um, you know, fine and well and together and living a good life with bipolar affective disorder. And then suddenly my brother went missing again. And um, very sadly, he actually committed suicide. We had no idea that he was experiencing depression again. Um, and it was very traumatic. He went missing for five days, four days, and um, we eventually found him at the bottom of a tower. He'd left off um, a tower that was actually on our family, um, a place where we spent our family holidays as children. So again, very traumatic. And I think that's another big shift in my world um, that happened then. I'd been trying to have kids. We'd, my husband and I had been trying to have kids, but we discovered we were having difficulties. And I made that decision in that moment that I was going to adopt my children. So the big shift there was that I then started kind of almost within weeks after Martin died to start to look into adoption. Obviously, it was kind of a grief response, you know. There have been so many moments in your life when you're looking back now where there was so much of trauma and uh, you went through it all and now you're able to share it with the rest of the world. Yeah. To move from that person who was so vulnerable at that point of time, going through the trauma, to be the resilient Colleen that you are today, how did you work on yourself? What did you do? What made you work on yourself? You know, the, it wasn't that I suddenly overnight became tough and strong. In fact, I actually became very tough and strong. I did. That's, that's true. I became 
you know, I'm going to face this world. And I became like, I used, I, I used the sort of archetype of as, as a warrior to guide me. I never spoke to people really about my feelings, about my emotions, my experiences or, or anything like that, because I don't think it felt very safe. And so I became really tough and took the world head on. You know, there were many other very traumatic experiences. Um, and then in, in early 2015, actually, um, I, I started traveling to India a lot, by the way, in about 20, sure, 2012, 20, 2011. And I've just fell in love with India. I mean, most, if you came to my house, you know, it's just, it's, I, I've just covered with Indian memorabilia and, and um, icons, etc. And I, I've, I used to step off the, the plane at Mumbai airport or in Delhi or Hyderabad or wherever I was going. And I used to feel like I was at home. So I, st- I just felt this incredible connection. I started to train. Um, what had happened in the, in the intervening years is I'd actually discovered coaching as a profession, become a professional coach. Um, I discovered neuroscience, started to do, you know, so I, so I started to study, I started to learn and understand about the brain, how the brain works and those kind of things. And so when I was teaching neuroscience and, and kind of for some reason, the Indian culture and myself were strongly attracted. They loved me and I loved India. Um, and I started traveling there so much. And I met um, a very beautiful um, Indian man by the name of Vivek. And Vivek said to me in 2015, he said, come and tell your story to India. And I said, no, I can't. I don't do that. And, and he said to me, um, no, you can't, you, you've got to come and tell your story. And he actually was the one who facilitated my TED talk, my first TED talk in Hyderabad. Um, and in, in fact, when he first facilitated it, I was going to talk about the brain and neuroscience and my knowledge and how to motivate people. But he asked me to talk, tell my story. And that was the first time that I start, stopped becoming as tough and warrior-like, although that was the title of the, of the, of the TED Talk was From Warrior to Warrior. But I started to accept that I could be open and vulnerable and share. And it was a big shift for me. It was a shift for me in my coaching because I was used to teaching people how to get over things. I was rescuing people, making sure that people are okay. But then I started to shift my, the work I do into teaching people to be okay with not being okay. You know, that it, it's not, it's, it's best. I always, my favorite saying is sad is not bad. It's just sad. Um, so particularly at the moment, I think if we're circling all the way back to what you started the conversation with, with we're going through difficult times at the moment is you know, it's very hard to coach people towards profound, meaningful and inspirational goals right now because we don't know what is happening. But a lot of people I find are really suffering at the moment because they're resisting what is, you know, and because we don't acknowledge that it's actually not okay what we're going through, what the planet is experiencing is hard, it is traumatic, it is difficult. And, you know, sort of eight years ago, seven, six years ago, I don't think I would have been able to take that stance. But now I help um, myself and others become present with what is to experience the the sadness to experience the grief that we that we're having when we lose people that we love when the fear of what is going to happen to us um, economic instability certainly in my country massive political instability um, but how do we actually stay present with it and help ourselves become the best version of ourselves as we navigate through these difficult times not not fighting our way through but navigating our way through. Um, so I think that's really the, the kind of emotional, psychological shift that I've had in the last few years. And as part of your story, Colleen, coaching and the neurosciences, how did they come into your life? Was it a choice or were you led into both of them? Yeah, and it's quite funny you say that. Was it a choice? I mean, we, you know, yeah. was it a choice is that you know what are the choices that the universe offers us so I'm not so sure if it was a choice but actually it was a very deliberate uh, mental shift that I occurred that occurred over a second traumatic experience that I had or one of the traumatic experiences which was when um, so I'd adopted my first child shortly after my brother died my daughter Abigail who's now in her late 20s and then I adopted my son um, Gabriel um, and when Gabriel was born, he was born with congenital hip displacement, um, which meant that his little hips were outside of the, um, the hip socket. And he had to have multiple surgeries. He was in a full body plaster cast for a couple of years. And it was a really tough time, you can imagine. 
But I wasn't worried about that because I said to the social worker that I can manage this because it's a physical disability. Um, so we navigated our way through the two years of Gabriel's physical, all the operations, being in a pl plaster cast. He was completely silent. He didn't speak for two years. This child did not speak. Um, very difficult to feed him, etc. From the moment that cast came off when he started when he was two years old that he didn't stop talking and he's never stopped talking since and he's so he's incredibly talkative and um, he's completely he, he actually spent almost the first two years of his life lying on top of my body literally in this terrible um plaster cast in those days they still had those um plaster of paris remember that yes. dreadful yeah. in that plaster of paris thing in this plaster of paris full body plaster cast and the only way i could give comfort to this poor little mite was to hold him and, and, and sleep with him on my body and anyway so Gabriel's plaster cast came off and the, I was actually speaking to my husband about it the other day when people always commented that Gabriel never used to take his eyes off me wherever I would go um, you know if we were on holiday or when we were at family dinner or lunch or anything his little eyes would follow me wherever we go and I think we still maintain that very strong bond to this day um, anyway so Gabriel comes out the plaster cast, he goes off to school and he's gregarious and he talks like a little genius and he's doing fantastically and I've got high hopes for, for my son. And just before he's due to go to, we call it big school, you know, which is sort of great, about five, six years old, um, the teacher says to me, no, she's very concerned. There's something not quite right. Mm -hmm. And the long and short of that story is that we actually discovered that Gabriel had profound um, brain dysfunction. So he has got something called fetal alcohol syndrome, which is um, his biological mother drank in the pregnancy and the alcohol literally shrinks babies' brains. Um, and Gabriel's got some profound intellectual disability. Well, not profound intellectual disabilities. He's just general disabilities, but also some amazing strengths like his ability to speak. Very beautiful looking boy. Um, he's just turned 21. Um, um, he's very uh, loving. He's, 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 a, he's a wonderful child, very passionate about horses. So he's at the moment, he's at the horse stables. He goes and kind of helps around at the horse stables during the day. He doesn't get paid for it, but um, but he's actually got an IQ of 67. So an inability to read or write or, you know, there's impulse control issues and that kind of thing. So he needs to be cared for forever. Um, he'll always be around about the age of 11 or 12 year old um, from an intellectual capacity. So that was the big shift was that just almost, the, it was August. In fact, we nearly there an anniversary. It was August, 2005, discovered that Gabriel had this brain impairment and that was almost like the trigger I then decided that I couldn't live, you know, this kind of casual, I'd, I had no motivation. I had, my career was by then I was, I think I might've told you is I was a beauty therapist. I was, I used to paint people's nails and do massages and decided to, I needed to make a difference in the world. And that's when I found coaching, um, which kind of led into um, discovery of neuroscience in the brain. And, you know, I was very lucky enough to be associated with um, an organization called the Neuro Leadership Institute, which kind of, mentored me and grew me as a to be, to be a master trainer I became a master coach eventually yeah that's that was okay, this. Like, you know this is so strange from uh, making sure that people's nails are beautiful they are beautiful externally you go in to check on something which still doesn't have a manual called the brain and uh, the shift is so drastic. It's like from one end of the spectrum, you're gone yeah. completely inside. Yeah. Was there a conversation that led you to neurosciences or did you read about it? Or was it uh, Gabriel? What is it that drew you to neurosciences? So that's very, it's, it is so interesting because firstly, I mean, firstly I'd failed, um, we call it matric. It's your highest grade at school. I'd, I'd, felt, I'd felt grade 11, which is the year before matric. So I'd never done well academically. And in desperation, my poor father, because my father was an intellectual, my brother was an intellectual. My mother's actually super smart as well. She just doesn't admit to it. Um, but I was kind of the, the dunce in the family. But in desperation, my dad actually took me on a, on a, a, a learning skills course at Tony Bazan, who I'm a great fan of. And I did one of his learning skills courses, learned how to do mind mapping and speed reading and keyword taking and these kind of skills. And, I, and in those days, it was sort of very pro, pro, sort of 
basic knowledge about the brain, but just learned how to use my brain better. Obviously, it clearly took me a while to really use it better after failing university a few times, but that was because I was probably having too much fun. Mm -hmm. um, so there was that kind of interesting link into neuroscience, but at a very basic level. And then um, a, a, a client, a beauty, beauty client of mine, I used to do her facials. Um, I still credit her with a huge change in my life. She, I started studying psychology because we'd gone through many uh, other right. traumatic experiences of, you know, we live in Johannesburg, it's a very dangerous society. There's a lot of, you know, um, crime and really violent crime that personal family family members of mine had experienced. So I'd done a trauma counseling course and a, and a, and a crisis counseling course to try and help my people around me that were going through all these terrible things. And, this, and, and I started doing, studying psychology, got my psychology undergraduate, got my clinical psychology um, honors degree. And then this friend of mine said to me, come and teach the psychology course at the British International College. And I said to her, no, I could never do something like that. I, I've never stood in front of anyone to talk. And she says, no, you can do it. And I remember sweating my way through um, hours and hours of studying these textbooks right through on the beach on, over Christmas and not knowing what to do and what I would say to these students. And I walked into that class. And so this was still while I was a beautician. And I started actually see, teaching the A-level psychology class. I mean, it was completely out of my depth. I was completely out of my comfort zone, but had fallen in love with psychology and trauma work and grief work and, and all of these kind of things. And um, so in a sense there was, because I'm, I'm very strongly uh, working in terms of neuroscience with the psychology of the brain and how the brain works. So I started to play with it a bit then. And then, interestingly enough, everybody thinks that I'm interested in neuroscience because of Gabriel having some brain dysfunction. But in fact, my passion is not really working with brain dysfunction, but working at um, with, with helping us develop really high-functioning brains. So I'm interested in the area of high performance, of motivation, of um, and whether that's emotional or um, professional, um, well-being, but but better than well-being, you know, being really profoundly in control of your mind, in control of how your brain functions. So that's really where my focus is now. Oh, wow. Okay, so how would you describe, Colleen, that uh, I know it's deep study, but uh, when we talk about high functionalities of our brain, for anyone to get to that code to understand, because each one I'm sure has a different functional level. So how yeah. do you find out your full potential as you're moving ahead in life? Sure, you are seeing some beautiful questions here because you're making me think. I don't say that there's this optimal kind of elixir of you know perfection that we are all look, seek, seeking out. Because I think it's very much every brain is an individual brain. Every person has their own individual interests, capacities. Um, my son, for example, I think has, has evolved way beyond what any professional said he would. Well, I know he has professional said he would in um, uh, 2005 when we discovered that he had brain dysfunction. Um, I myself don't even think I'm close to, you know, possibility of what I'm, I'm capable of. Um, I think every one of us has got capacity beyond belief, but here is the codicil to that. I always say you have got immense capacity to achieve things that you can never imagine possible. However, it takes effort. It takes commitment. It takes courage. Um, you'll hear me say this over and over again. It takes self-discipline. You know, self-discipline is part of becoming a better human being. And whether that's emotional self-discipline, physical self-discipline, relational self-discipline, all of those things take effort and it takes commitment. Um, I don't know if I answered your question there. So, <laughs> no, no, Of course you did, because I know that uh, that commitment is where most of us lack. And that's why we are not able to find our true potential and who we can be. I think maybe if, well, I'm saying commitment, but actually what commitment comes from self-worth. Because if I feel like I'm good enough um, to pay, that, that my health is important to me, then I'm going to be committed enough to pay attention to my health. If I feel that my mental and emotional well-being, if I'm worthy of having equanimity and passion and peace of mind and all of these things that we seek, if I'm worthy of it, then I'm going to be committed enough to 
could put in the effort to achieve that. Mm -hmm. So I guess, and I think that was a big thing for me because I didn't have self-worth. That little red girl in the red tricycle didn't have um, strong self-worth. And But you can learn it as, mm -hmm. well, as well. But rationally, I don't think our societies, whether it's an Indian culture, whether it's a Western culture, South African culture, I don't think we teach ourselves to have self-compassion, self-care. It's not yeah. indulgent. True. Um, it's not, it's, it's not um, you know, uh, you've got to be humble because otherwise you, you know, you're not of value. I think self-compassion is where compassion for others begins. But I don't think we teach that to people. Yes. I said and, uh, a long time yeah, <laughs> very, very, very true. And I think in the times of the pandemic, especially in the last one and a half years, uh, many people turned caregivers and forgot in the process to take care of themselves yes. and they had a burnout. So uh, I think that self-care and self-compassion and self-love that you're talking, uh, have you seen that uh, in the last 18 months, a lot has shifted towards the need for it? Absolutely. Oh, um, I, I, maybe, maybe that is one of the markers of, of, of what it is. We, who knows why we're going through what we're going through, but maybe it's not about planetary change, in that, for, but maybe personal change in that unless we, we are compassionate to ourselves, um, you know, it's, it's going to be very difficult because things haven't got easier. Mm -hmm. And, you know, may, may, maybe everybody's going to may, maybe, you know, start traveling with vaccine passports, etc. but we don't know that. Um, but here's the element of self compassion or compassion, actually in general, which has been quite life transforming for me to understand. I used to feel really, I used to care about people. And I was trying to help people. I think I was trying to help myself by helping others. You know, all the the counselling work and the grief work and the addiction work and the trauma work that I was doing was I was always trying to make things right for other people. But something I think that I've learned is that compassion actually is much higher than empathy compassion is much higher than sympathy it's much higher than support um, and I love to think of a hospice care worker for example a hospice care worker knows that the person that they are supporting is not going to make it they're at end of life they're, they're supporting them through the end of life process but that hospice care worker is able to show compassion for that person without an attachment to a positive outcome I think when we're trying to help people, when you're trying to rescue people, we get attached to that person being okay, to that person, um, you know, fixing themselves or, 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 or we're helping them to get to a better place mm -hmm. as opposed to just being there, caring, uh, being able to be present with that person, no matter what the outcome is. And I think we can translate that to self-compassion as well. If I'm compassionate to myself, I love myself and care for myself. In, and by the way, I'm still, a, I'm still a work in progress here. So don't think oh, that I'm... So. <laughs> this is why I have to do PhDs on these subjects because <laughs> it's so tough. But I do believe that to be compassionate to myself is to know that no matter where I end up, no matter what, because we don't know what the future is, no matter what the future is, no matter what the outcome is, I have developed enough resilience. I have the resources and I'm okay to navigate that no matter what it is. And I think that's about self-compassion more than just, you know, hot baths and candles, although I think those are great, <laughs> great things to do as well. True, very true. Because one of my friends always says that meditation doesn't have to always be sitting in one place and chanting. It can even be walking on grass and being mindful of it. Yeah, yeah because, you know, what you spoke just now, Khalid, about uh, doing it for others especially with hospice workers and not and knowing the outcome is not going to be positive uh, it takes me back to a verse in the Bhagavad Gita which is all about uh, doing your work and not worrying about the fruits so the detached yes. attachment that comes yes. in where yeah. the symbol for me is the lotus and that's where uh, I connected with you in that webinar as well, where you brought in that beautiful lotus. And uh, my, my question at this point is, what does the lotus symbolize for you? So, and the, the beauty of the lotus fly, and I, and I love the symbolism in um, the ancient scriptures around, around this kind of concept is that, that, that we, we live, through, we learn through suffering. You know, that is, 
learning doesn't occur. People don't put it in. It's, it's wonderful to have the light times and the easy times and the joyful times. That's not where we learn and grow. We learn through suffering or we have the opportunity to learn through suffering or not, but it's our life journey. We choose whether we do or not. And so, so the Lotus only being able to survive in the muddy, swampy water um, means that the beauty can only shine out when we do experience difficulties and challenges. So to be okay with that, to be present and at peace with that, and even within the times of darkness and despair, um, it's not that we've got to be all joyful because everything's going to be fine in the end, but we need to be present in order to grow. We need to be able to be present with, with the darkness, with the despair, um, because it is. It is what it is. So be present with it. And um, and out of that shall come um, growth and fulfillment. And we can use words like enlightenment, although I, th I feel that's really above my my. Um, my mental ability to to conceptualize it even closely um the other thing i think which um also somebody pointed out on that webinar which was quite nice is that the the seed of the lotus is always there you know and it's and it flowers blossom you know sort of a petal by petal by petal not all at once so it's an emergent process it's not just a we put it in germinate it grows and dies and that's it yeah, very, very, very true. And uh, you said you have a strong connect with India. So is there something about Indian philosophy? Because the picture you shared with you in a sari, you seem so comfortable in a sari <laughs> itself. Yeah. So uh, is there something about Indian philosophy also that intrigued you, interested you, uh, or uh, which you liked uh, when you were connected visiting India so often or was it just the people that drew you to the country? So I think it's largely the people. Um, I, I don't, I'm not sure why, but I have a, a, a energetic resonance with Indian people, whether they're South African, Indian or um, in India itself. Although I do feel a connection with the, the, like I said, when I step off the plane, there's something that feels kind of right for me. Mm -hmm. And definitely very humbly and very lightly um, I've delved into, um, you know, especially Buddhist philosophy, um, the hi history of, of India, etc. And I think you, you may or may not know that my particular area of expertise is mindfulness. And my PhD thesis was all about integrating Eastern philosophies of mindfulness with Western perspectives um, of mindfulness um, and, and I do feel that, that the Indian spiritual traditions are being much more accepted with, within Western perspectives. And by the way, I say Eastern spiritual traditions, but when I go to India, often I feel like I'm taking, you know, how can I, how, how can I have the audacity to speak about mindfulness in India? Because India is mindfulness, but in actual fact, we have attached ourselves to this modern culture and technology. And even in India, a lot of people have lost their, their connection with, their, with mindfulness and spirituality and meditation and that kind of thing. Um, so I think it's maybe um, the mindfulness, uh, the, the being present in the present moment um, without attachment, and paying attention to our inner being, um, which I do believe a lot of the Indian traditions are really focused on. Not, not that uh, other religions aren't, but I just love the humbleness. And I also love the, the color and the expansiveness of, of Indian belief systems as well. I just, it brings me joy. Yeah, true. I'm oh, and the sari, I love wearing a sari. And my Indian friends say, say to me that I wear a sari like I've lived in one forever. And, and not, not pre-pin sorries, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, okay. So the pandemic calling, what have your lessons from the pandemic been? And uh, what is it that you see the pandemic? Because recently I was listening to Martin Seligman, where he was saying that uh, we are languishing and it is a kind of a birthing process happening now. Yeah, and what is yeah. going to come out of this? The midwifing process is going to bring out flourishing. So, and before the flourish, this is important. Yeah, so, the I guess. Yeah. Um, and you know what, Rashmi, I don't know. And I don't think any of us know. So it's a lovely concept and it's a lovely, it's a lovely idea to attach to. Um, so I'm, I do say in order for people to be able to be present and experience where they are right now, 
is we have to accept the, the darkness of, of where we are right now. I don't think there's a, a joyful light on it and, oh, well, it's okay because we're going to be better at the end of it. I think it is hard. I think it is tragic. I think it is unacceptable that the planet is going through what we're going through, but it is what it is. Mm. So for me, a lot of my work is about firstly helping myself be present with what we're experiencing, um, not to be in fear, worry, and anxiety about what future state may or may not emerge. Even hope to a certain extent is giving my power away to an in, uh, uh, what's it, a, a intended or a, a, a possible future state. Mm. Um, so in order, I think, I think that for, for us to navigate this, we need to learn to be able to be present with where we are right now, the good and the bad, find the joyful moments, um, be, you know, find connection to, to other people that to create what is meaningful for us in the moment where we are right now. And in that way, I think we gather the resources and the wisdom and the courage to actually face whatever it is that the future comes. I do hope that Martin Seligman has got a magic wand or, or, or what's, it, what's it, a future <laughs> looking glass that is that it is going to, um, and usually we know that through suffering we emerge like the lotus. Um, but this, yeah. but this is the time where we gather resources and we gather wisdom and we gather our courage, and I think that's all we're in charge of and compassion, compassionately. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, so as we leave, uh, Colleen, what have been your three life lessons that you'd like to leave us with? Because I know you're a cyclist as well, and that's somebody who's been through a lot there as well, physically, and come out in flying colors. So. Uh, your three life lessons from when you look back at life, what would it be? <laughs> okay, so I promise you, you're putting me on, me on the spot here because I certainly haven't thought this through, but I'm going to definitely give it some deeper thought. Um, so you mentioned cycling. Um, I'm not sure if I mentioned that I never in my life thought I'd do yoga. I'm just not the supple kind of keep still kind of person. That's why cycling was so good for me. But in actual fact, when lockdown started, we had a serious lockdown here. I started yoga and I did 200 sessions of yoga in one year from the 6th of April to the 6th of April. And then I went, Colleen, you know how you have to create a new habit. It has to be part of your life. It has to be consistent. So I set myself a 365 day challenge. And I'm on about, I did mention that in the webinar, I think I'm on about day 90 ish right now of my 365 day challenge. I have a broken collarbone. And I'm now doing one-armed yoga. I sit on my bicycle every day with my arm in a sling and I, the indoor bike and I ride my bike. So I think the lesson from that is, but it brings me joy. It, it brings me pleasure because I'm honoring my body and I feel better when I do physical exercise. And I love my yoga now. For, for me, that's mindfulness in motion. You can, people can call it obsessed, but I actually, it's, it's how I honor my physical well-being because my mental well-being is much better when I'm honoring my physical well-being. The endorphins and the energy etc that I get from the cycling but then the peace of mind and the mindfulness that I get from the yoga so I was saying I would never do yoga in public um, because you'd laugh your head off um, however it is for me mindfulness in motion and I and I just I will never change my yoga my yoga daily practice so I guess the life lesson coming from that sorry I'm making a long story here is about endurance and commitment um, I have learned in my life that if I, if I want to do something and I want to make a change, then I make a commitment to doing that thing every single day of my life. The other life lesson is to not rescue people, which I'm still learning and still trying and not to even um, try to be rescued myself, but to rather sit and be a, a sacred space where people can, can experience whatever it is they need to experience in an unconditional way. Um, positive love and care but trusting them that they can navigate through their own spaces and that I can also navigate through my own spaces what would be my third life lesson um, my third life lesson which I think I'm really learning um, because I've never really been um, a team player I'm very individualistic and I think I'm going to have to learn um, to be more part of a team and a group rather than to be so individualistic and driven on my own but that's that's that I'm I'm a I'm a in nursery school still. So. <laughs> okay, but I'm intrigued by one life lesson here which you just shared, and I want you to quickly say that you said you never rescue people nor yourself, and uh, why not? 
Why not rescue people? I don't. I, I went, I've spent years and years of my life trying to rescue people um, because it gave me meaning and purpose. I realized my job is not to rescue people, but to empower people, to mm -hmm. enable them to be able to navigate whatever it is that they are experiencing. And I can be that, like I said, sacred space to support them, to have empathy, to have care, but I don't have to take them out of it. Most of the times when we see somebody in pain, we want to take that pain away. Um, and, and when I say for myself, it's about not needing somebody else to take my pain away um, to help me, but to, to find people who can sit with me and allow me to find the wisdom and the strength and the character to move on myself. Awesome, awesome. This is so beautiful, Colleen. Thank you so much for your time. And, uh, you know, uh, I think life is all about being human and uh, being mindful, being just present, being in the now. And I think these times have told us this is what we need, basically. God bless you. Continue to inspire. And thank you so much for being a part of you and I with Rashmi Shetty. Thank you. It's a great honor. Take care. Bye. Bye. With that, we come to the end of this episode of You and I with Rashmi Shetty. Do let us know your feedback and your guest suggestions. Write in to rashmi.thethirdeye at gmail.com. That is R-A-S-H-M-I dot T-H-E T-H-I-R-D-E-Y-E -E at gmail.com.